My name is Lene Dammen Lund. I'm the rector of the Royal Danish Academy, uh, and it is a really big honor to be here and to be the one presenting uh, the speech by Omar Gandhi. And before we delve into the remarkable work of Omar Gandhi, let me briefly introduce the Royal Danish Academy, where I am rector. It's founded in 1754. The Academy, Academy has fostered generations of architects who has shaped the world with their ingenuity, while also instilling the importance of cultural heritage and sustainable design. We have around 1,200 students of architecture, design and conservation. The science track at this UIA has been led by some of our researchers. I really hope you will find time to enjoy some of these uh, presentations too. In my eyes, Omar Gandhi and his work plays a particular important role, not only in regards to the UN Sustainability Goals, the theme of this UIA 2023, but also to a challenge actually mentioned in the latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. As usual, they make it clear that we must act a rapid, uh, achieve a rapid, comprehensive reduction of greenhouse gases in every sector in this decade. But they also write about the knowledge we need. And I quote, diverse knowledge and values include cultural values, indigenous knowledge, local knowledge, and scientific knowledge. In continuation of a focus on culture, they write, we need to focus on demand-side management, whereas, as you will know, discussions frequently involve only the supply side, new types of energy, etc. They write, social, cultural, and behavioral changes can accelerate the adaptation. They write, because motiv motivation is generally quite low and inadequate if it's not followed up by structural and cultural changes. So how on earth do we do this? The report made by scientists doesn't really have an answer. But Omar, I think you do. And that's why I'm really looking forward to this uh, lecture. Because you are an inspiring figure whose works exemplify the fusion of cultural values and sustainable architecture. With a deep appreciation for cultural context and sensitivity, to the environment, your designs transcend the structures to become reflections of the people and places they inhabit. Your designs are rooted in an empathetic understanding of the communities they serve. You explore and embrace cultural heritage, drawing inspiration from local traditions, craftsmanship and materials. This approach fosters a sense of belonging and cultural identity within the built environment. Your architectural approach incorporates a profound understanding of the power of architectural narratives and the strategic use of light. You masterfully weave together the unique qualities of the site with the people who inhabit them creating compelling and meaningful architectural experiences. I will end this presentation, introduction, with a quote of a philosopher called Jane Bennett. She says, There will be no greening of the economy, no redistribution of wealth, no enforcement or extension of rights without human dispositions, moods and cultural ensembles hospital to these effects. Your work, Omar Gandhi, are very inspirational in this respect. Please, the stage is yours. Well, thank you, everybody. What a huge honor it is to be able to share some of our work uh, with you guys. It was a huge day of travel yesterday, and I was afraid for a little while there, and I was emailing constantly, just saying, oh, I'm stuck here, this plane got canceled. So it's, uh, it's really wonderful that I was able to uh, make it and uh, be a part of this event. For me, uh, light has always been sort of the, 
uh, drum and bass of architecture. It's the drama. Uh, and it's always been a really important part um, that we use as a tool. Before architecture for me, uh, photography was really a way that I was able to experiment and really sort of jump into this idea that light could be uh, a dramatic tool in sharing a story. This was actually a project uh, in my first year of school in Halifax. Uh, it was a moon-gazing pavilion. And essentially what it was, was that it was set up over one evening in the middle of the night, and we weren't able to actually put a structure on this hill that's in the center of the city in Halifax, but it was set up so that you would just have the moonlight coming in at that exact direction. And of course, we lit it from the inside, and so there's always this duality of both night and day. In my first days of practice on my own, I became obsessed with kind of these very raw images of architecture uh, and that play of light. You know, how we could take something really simple, whether it was natural or artificial light, and really start to kind of tell these dramatic stories through those images. It was this image, actually, it's funny, and don't read too much into what the image is, because it, it's a little dark, obviously, uh, but Caravaggio's uh, painting here really sort of told this story to me about chiaroscuro, the idea of light emerging from darkness, and that powerful way of telling stories through both light and dark. And so our practice over the last 13 years or so across Canada has really become known for these sort of single-family modern uh, interpretations of traditional architecture, uh, primarily in rural spaces. Uh, budgets were always quite modest, but there was really always an opportunity, for the most part, in really exploring light uh, and these dramatic sort of effects in the landscape. This was a project that we completed uh, about a year and a half ago in Toronto. Uh, there was a space building set up by another architect in Toronto, Diamond Schmidt, and what we really, really encouraged them to do was strip down the outside. We had a little bit of play there, and they were, they were really sort of intending on making the outside a little bit more dramatic as a developer building. And we said, oh, you know what, just strip that texture, strip the windows, like, let's just make this, you know, a real urban building that's, you know, almost forgettable. And the idea there was that we would have this opportunity to tell this really exciting story on the inside that would be a surprise. And so you go in this side door that really isn't marked, and you enter into this restaurant for famed uh, chef Matty Matheson in Toronto. And inside is this sculptural wood ceiling with a long skylight down the middle that reflects light down. And of course, you have street light, and you have these cars moving and people moving on the outside of the screen, and so the inside is heavily animated. This is actually a section through uh, the structure, and outside of the main uh, kitchen space, or dining room space, there was this opportunity to do an accessible bathroom. And we thought, well, why can't that also be something really exciting? And so you can see here that we funneled this washroom up uh, and made that a really exciting space uh, that happens to be a place where people love to take selfies for some reason. Uh, weird that there's a lineup at the washroom like that. This is another restaurant in Toronto where we took this hundred and something year old building that was dilapidated and really was planned on being used for residential. It had three stories and was really sort of gutted uh, on the inside. And so from the outset, the idea you know, how can we make this a special space? Again, with that idea of surprise, right? I love the idea that you can use light and space as a tool for really just throwing people off and bringing joy. And so we carved out that floor plate on all three stories so that light came from above. And you can really see this filtering of light that comes down the space with all this white oak on the inside. I'll talk briefly about this project. Um, this was a project uh, done in collaboration with KPMB Architects in Toronto. Uh, and it really started with uh, indigenous ideas sort of at the outset. And so there was this real sort of importance of the outdoors and the landscape and natural light being um, a way to really soften and make this proposed new gallery in Halifax something that had an immense amount of warmth. 
And so through those consultations and really listening to their ideas, we were able to work over the next several months on this competition, which we ended up winning, uh, and came up with this really serpentine-like form that had all these beautiful outdoor spaces, but really allowed for the outside light to shine in from inside. So this big kind of carve up the middle on the front entry that allows some of the interior light to come out like a curtain. And then on the inside, opening up to all this amazing light that filters down through that wood. We, of course, use a lot of wood in our projects, primarily wood that's uh, native to the area in Eastern Canada. This project here in the south shore of Nova Scotia, and let me just say, Nova Scotia is on the east uh, shore or east coast of Canada, and is actually a climate that's not too dissimilar to the climate we have here. Uh, it's on the coast, it's fishing villages and a uh, real sort of agricultural landscape. And so this is a really sort of far out uh, rural, uh, untouched landscape. Um, that really was meant to feel like a bump in the landscape itself. If you blinked your eye, it would feel like the landscape actually rose above. And so in this particular case here, the idea was to really shape not only view and perspective, as well as the procession through this building, but again, unveiling this idea of natural light and this immense view that you don't see coming. And the building sort of acts almost as a bit of a cork screw uh, at the end of the building that sort of squeezes you in and it becomes very vertical and almost feels a little claustrophobic as you enter through the main part of this space. And you can see in plan, it really sort of bends out and feels almost like part of the topography. And on the inside, it opens up. And so you walk in from that tall, vertical, narrow space to this long, horizontal band that really has this infinite landscape in the horizon. And you can see here, you know, it really feels like, you know, we often talk of our buildings having uh, almost the spirit of a creature at night that comes alive and feels like there's this dual sort of personality to our architecture. And I'm sure some of these details and materials are, again, not too dissimilar to what we see over here. Beautiful cedar shingles that are crafted um, very meticulously, but in the same way that it's meticulous and it's contemporary, it's also very traditional and things that were very common to people, especially the builders. This is a project that we completed about a year and a half ago as well. Uh, which is on the other coast of uh, Canada, um, in the Okanagan, which is really this wine valley, a really dry sort of desert sort of landscape. Uh, and so there's this beautiful outcropping. And again, we tried to use the architecture to almost feel like an outcropping on this hillside. So this kind of continued lump uh, in this rusted steel that protects from fire. And of course, in this area, like many parts of Canada right now are prone to fire. And so there was heavy regulations in terms of the materials that you use. But as you approach this, you actually approach it from uh, the, tr the cross section and wind your way up the building. And at the core of it, you'll see is this beautiful light well that sort of reaches out in the sky. And so again, this opportunity for surprise and joy, but also about activating the house at different times of the day with the sun moving and the moon moving and you get this really sort of shimmering sort of quality on the inside of the house when the lights are off. This is a project that we're actually really sort of in the first quarter in right now. This was an early sketch. Uh, this is a library that we're working on with Sturgis Architecture in uh, Edmonton. And so the idea here was that it was really set in this landscape, this really sort of suburban landscape, and meant to feel like almost a plug on this empty, beautiful site. And again, this idea that you walk through and transverse from different directions and feel this immense warmth that, again, with this hard shell on the outside, feels like a real surprise. And so we have rammed earth, 
and we have mass timber and core 10 steel on the outside. And a lot of, a lot of this, again, like much of our architecture, is driven by consultation with indigenous peoples in the area. And so you can see here this plug with this immense, beautiful landscape uh, with many ways in. Uh, but then, you know, I think the last thing you would really expect is when you get inside, you end up having these beautiful sort of portals that break through the mass timber ceiling. And so here with our consultants, TransSolar, we were really able to explore solar gain and really the most effective ways to have daylight on the inside. And so again, this is still early on in the project, but it's, it's going to be a really special one for us because uh, this isn't just a central library kind of in the city, it's a community library. So there's a real sort of scale uh, to it that I think is a beautiful one to kind of hold in your hand almost and, you know, everybody in the community goes there, right? As we know, libraries have evolved so much over the last few decades and really become sort of community centers in a way. And so this is a house uh, also in the last couple of years that we completed that's obviously kind of over the top, believe it or not, for one couple. Um, <laughs> not 100 couples, one couple. Um, and uh, really here, you know, the play with craft, uh, it's obviously about uh, natural light coming from different directions, but just the way that light really kind of, uh, I think really highlights the craft and gives it a different sort of character throughout the day is really wonderful. Um, on this site, it actually wraps around a point and so you're getting kind of this 180 degree view with the sun always moving, obviously, you really have a lot of activation on the inside. And again, through that stone use and the meticulously crafted wood, you know, you really get a sense of that movement uh, on the inside, which really is kind of, you know, another character, almost another material that we use that's almost more dynamic than the physical materials themselves. And again, another example of a highly crafted interior that's you know, quite monotone in terms of its palette, homogenous, but you have this shimmering light that really sort of activates it. This is one of our, I think, better known projects that was completed you know, closer to a decade ago. And again, is this idea of drawing from the vernacular, the idea of drawing from things that are very common, materials that are very common in the area. But really, we explored back then this idea of light in different ways. So we have skylights, obviously. We have light that wraps around the building that look out to this immense valley and this long ocean view. But then we have these scars running down the back of the building that really sort of open up the staircase and give, again, this really sort of dynamic moving quality to the interior space. And again, this idea that the entry side is more of a plug, this almost kind of uh, solid form where the thing that you would expect the least is that when you go on the inside, it's quite open and looks out. So this, this play that we always have of surprise is obviously a fundamental part of our process. This project that sits right on the coast with tremendous winds, much like we've had in the last couple of days here, at least my hair says that, um, that looks out to this view. And really the idea here was that the roof really cuts into the wind. It's, it's bent down almost like a hat that's pulled down low and wind just howls over the top of it. But you have this long band of windows as well as skylights that really open up the space and make this thing that feels almost bunker-like feel really heavy. another house on the coast here uh, that really sort of takes sort of half of a section of a gambrel roof form that you really see in sort of those agricultural landscapes where we cut in half and have this folded metal roof that then opens up on the other side and looks out to the ocean. But over here, there was this real play of condensing the space and really sort of pushing that entry sequence into a smaller, tight, darker space, which is really a game that we play a lot of the time, but really playing with shadows. So an equal part to the natural light that we use, you know, we're really sort of focusing on the effects of shadows as well. 
This is actually my house uh, that was finished about a year and a bit ago. And you'll see that the front screen of this was really meant as a screen for privacy, both for myself and my family, but also for the street itself. You know, you see these examples of new condos and, you know, modern buildings with glass sort of over the street, which feels like a real sort of infringement on people on the sidewalk with you hanging over them. And so there's this really wonderful thing that people can never see in, uh, but we are sort of limited in the way that we can see out as well. And so this is it. It feels again like a really heavy monolithic form with white cedar on the outside and brick that fold around. Materials that you see in that particular specific area quite often. And you can see that screen there on the outside. And so, of course, we can't really look down that easily and no one can really see up. You see this sort of dense screen on the outside. And that's actually red cedar. And then we have this gallery space at the back that really is kind of the main hangout space where the fireplace is. And the idea here was how can we use skylights? How can we use redirected light in a way that's really diffused and sort of common throughout the day so that you don't have these really hot, intense periods and then really dark periods throughout the day? And so we ended up working with a dear friend, uh, Lacune, uh, who did these studies that really showed, you know, what would be the best time of the day, what you know, that would work throughout the year to have the most sort of seamless period of light. And so really sort of cost-effective ways to really, I would say, make a space dynamic uh, through simple means. And this is a picture of my son. I don't know what he's doing. I probably said, can you go sit there? <laughs> and so this is that space looking up. Uh, at the back, and so you can see the light well there, and uh, his bedroom is actually where that little square is, and he has a desk there, so he gets redirected light in his bedroom uh, through that glass, and then that light sort of, I guess, shimmers down into the living space throughout the day. So you can see how that works. And then in the bathrooms, which are actually in the central parts of the house, so don't have windows on the sides, uh, are entirely lit from above. And so you have this beautiful sort of lightness in a space that's using really dense, heavy materials and a dark palette, but is actually you know, filled through. It's probably the brightest part of the whole house. And just to complete, I may have gone too fast, but just to finish, I always put my team there. Um, thank you guys very much for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. We actually have time for some questions, and I might start off posing a few. And if any of you have uh, questions, we could take them afterwards. I'm not, I don't have a clock, so someone has to tell me when to stop up here. But uh, let's have a seat. <laughs> so... Uh, this may come as a surprise, but I thought maybe we could talk a bit about light. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and uh, not cats. I, I really not no. I really loved the fact that you started off talking about the moonlight. Yes. Because very often we are talking about daylight, and we will be doing that. But I was wondering, you know, what is it about the moonlight? Because we don't use moonlight to see something. Yeah. It does something else to us. Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> you know, I, I don't think, you know, I, I don't know what it's like here, but it's always a real surprise when you see it, right? When the moon is full and bright, it's such a special thing. People get really excited. So it isn't something that we've actually focused a project on, but, I mean, it would be a wonderful thing, right? I mean, even if it means, you know, at one particular time during the year, which was really what that project was about, we had figured out exactly where the moon was going to be on a specific day, and the whole thing was based on this idea of seeing it align. Um, I just and, and if you yeah. go back in history, yeah. I mean, there are lots of uh, historic places that are designed around the moonlight and the way it circulates. So maybe yes. it uh, maybe it makes us think about the fact that we are part of a bigger universe Absolutely. or something. 
Absolutely. Yeah, it's fascinating. It is. <laughs> mm. I love, you should work more with them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, back to the daylight. Um, I, I uh, noticed that you are talking several times about the comfort that the light brings, the warmth. Of course. Um, so, so light for you, is that very much about the atmosphere of, of the building or how do you see it? Well, I think uh, in particular in the cases of our projects where they're often designed to be quite um, private or heavy in a way, um, I think what's nice about it is it, it gives uh, a spirit to a space, right? I mean, there's a spiritual aspect, no doubt, but also maybe hope, maybe uh, health. Um, uh, you know, is anybody upset about a sunny day? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't know exactly what it's like over here, but on the East Coast where I live, uh, it's, it's a climate that's gray uh, a good percentage of the time. And so um, I think that uh, it's something that we celebrate. We celebrate, but I think in equal measure, it's something that needs to be controlled. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's really the art of it, is how can you control something uh, that if you have too much of isn't, isn't good for things? like wood and artwork and mm -hmm. and also but and also light is very particular to the place where you are yes. every place has its own light so in controlling that i suppose you're also bringing uh, forward the quality of the place uh, into Absolutely. your buildings yeah. at least this is what it looks <laughs> exactly. like exactly <laughs> yeah you are also working with indigenous people. Um, what is the quality that brings to your work? Well, I think there's always an opportunity for it to take uh, an entirely different direction. I think that's what's wonderful about it is that by listening, and you, you know, I think architects might be guilty of not listening often enough. People are guilty of that. Um, we're learning new ways of thinking about the world, right? And relationships with the landscape. And so I think, it's, uh, a, it, it's an immensely valuable asset and um, yeah, I, I, it's just wonderful to be able to look at the world in a diff through a different lens and I love the idea that projects can evolve in a really honest way. Have you made, uh, have you had projects in places where you were very unfamiliar? We're always really unfamiliar, really. I mean, even if we think we are, we're definitely not, right? So, you know, there's you know, a, a real sort of saying when working with indigenous peoples that, you know, we need to work with them, right? And so these are not just ideas that we take and translate. I think it's really important for them to be at the core of those ideas right from the beginning. And I think for us, it's, it's meant that we've had results that uh, were a complete surprise in a wonderful way. And they are engaged in the actual design process, or how does it work? Yeah, well, of course, they're not architects, but they're, um, you know, I think there's an understanding of building, there's an understanding of space, uh, there's an understanding of the landscape and how these things go together. And so, of course, there may be a removal from kind of the professional side of it that, you know, uh, we're more engaged in, but, you know, I think having people uh, involved as much as possible is a good thing, for sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe someone in the audience has a question? Yes? There's a mic. Uh... One an idea from Denmark and the other a question about India. The Danish one is the metro system here has beautiful um, halls coming and at the top they often put prisms. Yeah. Kids love to see, where's the light today, where's the light tomorrow? Yeah. I wonder if you've thought about introducing prisms as an alternative, as a little touch that could be put into some of your homes or buildings. And the idea from India, Purnima, the full moon, means an awful lot to people. There are many festivals, etc. It might be possible to uh, adapt some of your ideas to an Indian home where, and Purnima, the moon comes in as well as the light and fills the house, Absolutely. especially as in the summertime where it's quite hot and people are up during the night and asleep during the midday. So. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Joel from Belgium. Um, I'm just curious, the fact that you design a lot of residential houses, 
Do you have a, preferation, a pref preferred orientation for your windows? Would you prefer to design to the north or to the south? It's a debate we have, and I'm curious to hear. Well, uh, for my house, it's actually facing north. Uh, well, sorry, no, let me take that back. It was, we thought it was going to be to the north, but, um, and, and so all of our sort of studies were going in that direction. Um, but when you're in a climate that's quite gray uh, and, you know, isn't intense a lot of the time, uh, we ended up going south. So I think, you know, it's really then exploring ways to uh, extrapolate as much sunlight as possible, but then also controlling it in kind of the extreme summer climate uh, where it can be too hot as well. So for us, it's, it's actually turned out to be south for the most part. Hey, Omar. Oh. It's Jason, oh, hi. Jason from Canada. Hi, Jason. Um, I wonder if you could take a moment to talk about the shape of light. So you said nobody complains about a sunny day. And when people go visit a cathedral, they'll say, oh, the light in here is amazing, and then walk outside into the full light. But it's something about the shape of light in your projects that we might see in a cathedral that really affects that. So could you talk about that a bit? You know, it's a funny thing uh, in contemporary architecture, you know, imagining, you know, it, we all know spaces that are just completely lit, right? I mean, people, I, I don't know exactly why everything needs to be so bright all the time. Like, you know, just even just thinking about your f favorite restaurants growing up, you know, they were soft and they were warm and the acoustics were wonderful and they were dimly lit. People, that, would, that doesn't happen anymore, right? People want surfaces that can be cleaned easily and they want it to be bright and, you know, kind of uniform. And so it's one of the wonderful things about you know, the privilege of the kind of work that we do is uh, we can really sort of take advantage of darkness. You know, I, I love that. You know, I'm always sort of enamored by that idea of, you know, that hallway with, you know, uh, you know like a cauldron or something. You know, like these beautiful, like medieval sort of corridors that have uh, light that just comes from a single source. Um, we often also don't have low light, uh, you know, you know, table lights or floor lamps or those sort of things anymore. Um, it's always this field of pot lights, which is my least favorite thing. Um, and so I think, yeah, that, that's it. It's like the shape of light is completely in balance with the shape of darkness. Yeah. And that's a fun game that you can in particular do in private projects where, you know, you're not necessarily following, you know, public standards of... What else? Good afternoon, Peter. Matt Keith from Arkansas. Um, one thing I'm struck by through the range of your work is east coast across the expanse of Canada West, not quite yet to Vancouver, but perhaps right. still out there in the future. We think here in the Nordic region of uh, a light essentially around 60 degrees north latitude, mm -hmm. right? There's a, a latitudinal approach or understanding of your work, but there's also a longitudinal approach. And I wonder if you could comment a bit about working on the East Coast, working in Toronto, working out in the plains and, and so forth, and how, again, you tune yourself to those conditions. For sure. Uh, you know, light is obviously you know, a major consideration there. I would say the, the thing that varies the most for us east to west is rain, the kind of rain. Uh, and on the east coast, you know, it's most common that wind is blowing sideways, right? It's very windy and gusting. And whereas you almost imagine on the west coast, you know, just sort of falling like a, a curtain constantly, right? And so I think it's really sort of shapes the way that uh, some of those interior spaces were, uh, work based on overhangs and the shape of the roof that really sort of captures uh, the essence of, of both light and uh, rain there. So I would say that more so than the way that we've been responding to light, um, it's the, the shape of our architecture is more a response to precipitation. Any more questions? Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, Megan from US via Switzerland. Um, I was just wondering, 
What advice would you give for early stage designers who are passionate about daylighting who might not necessarily have as much um, autonomy in their own firm yet? I would say, you know, collect the way you feel in your own experiences um, in different parts of your everyday life, right? I think, you know, that's it, right? I mean, I think it's different when you're working on paper and you're working on a project um, and sort of working in a bit of a bubble there. But I think the opportunities to shape light and shape darkness and really kind of shape space in the way that you experience it uh, comes from your own memory and imagination. I mean, I would say that most of the things in particular, for example, with my own home, uh, were things that I just collected. And it's like, you know, this, these are the sort of things that I want to do when I get to do it one day, if I'm lucky. Um, and that's what it was, was just sort of collecting these feelings uh, of experiencing space. So I would say that, just take note of those things. Hi, Omar. Thank hey. you so much for such a great conversation. Thank you. Uh, Patrick from Newfoundland, Canada, uh, currently working in Copenhagen. Nice. Um, growing up on the East Coast, I often find that the dialogues around design and architecture are so rooted in what the world can teach us, uh, especially you know what Scandinavia can teach us about design and living, uh, what the Nordics can teach us about light. Um, is there something that you think uh, Atlantic Canada or even Canada in general can teach the world on design? Um, it, well, I would say if, the, if there was something that I've paid particular attention to and respect is how extreme the climate can be. And so as much as I think it's extreme in Nova Scotia, you know, it's 10 times more extreme where you are in Newfoundland, right? And so, you know, buildings need to be resilient, right? And that, that might mean you can't have a fully glazed building because it's you know poor for energy consumption it's poor for uh, withstanding kind of those extreme winds potentially you know things like that and so how can you look at traditional modes of uh, creating space that's almost kind of singular to that area and you look around at these historical precedents how can you kind of like create a lineage of that same idea but really push it, push it because of technology, push it because of what's available now, um, that sort of thing. So I would say, you know, it's an architecture of resilience. Hi, um, so mine's more of a comment rather than a question, but um, it was really interesting because in the initial projects that you showed especially, you said that you have a little bit of a limitation on budget. And so to have that limitation and also I'm sure a, a lot of other constraints as well in terms of space and everything and still find a way to play with light in the way that your projects do is really interesting. And especially in parts of the world where I come from, which is Pakistan, um, there's um, more of a traditional sort of design where you know uh, what works, you know the return on the investment that the contractor, the owner um, has. Um, and so uh, you have like a very limited way of playing with that kind of light. And so to find that balance between investment and like the tectonic quality of the project is really interesting. If I could just say one thing about that. Um you know, a lot of the times when we're proposing, you know, modern ideas in very rural places, for example, you know, it is almost definitely the first time the builder and maybe even the client have ever even considered that or built anything like it. It's completely new, right? And so what really worked for us from the outset was using terminology and architectural ideas that are familiar. And so, for example, shingles and a gable roof or a hip roof, um, you know, those sort of things that you don't even need to use kind of the words that end up scaring people. You're actually using vocabulary and architectural ideas that are part of the everyday. And so it isn't about fooling anyone, but it's about kind of 
uh, I would say presenting it in a way that is just slightly different from what's completely familiar. I always talk about our projects as being a part of a family. Like it's, it's on the street, it's part of the family on the street architecturally, but it's definitely the weird kid in the family. So it's still related, but the bonkers one. Hi, my name is Marta, and I'm currently the international student in Denmark in architecture. And I have a question because we know that the glass is a go really good conductor for the heat. And I have a question about the overheating because I know that what I saw in the presentation, most of your work is in Canada, so in the climate which is not exposed for really high temperature. And how could you? Do you have any technique to avoid overheating, but actually support good living conditions by having the natural daylight inside the um, area or space which you create? Well, like you said, we don't, depending on where we're working, I mean, there are parts of Canada that get very hot during the summer, um, you know, not for a, a long part of the year, but, you know, you certainly want to be able to control it. Uh, and of course, when dealing with you know, thermal bridging of any kind, you want to deal with it outside for the most part, right? So, you know, whether it's louvers or brisoles or um, those kind of shading devices that can, that are architectural but are outbound of the glazing, whether it's windows or skylights, that's always been sort of the best thing for us is, um, it basically means that for the majority of the year, you're gonna have light penetrating the space, but for that period of time, uh, where you want to keep it out as much as possible, um, you know, it's going to do that in a really simple way. I have a question. You know, at the Royal Danish Academy, we have this huge space where we have an artificial sun. So when the students make models, they can actually test the light and they can decide where on the globe and what time of day and year. I don't suppose you have a space like that. So, so, so when you design, um, honestly, are you sometimes surprised when you see the building and you see the light, or is it always like you imagined? Uh, there's a lot of accidents, for sure, right? I mean, it's always the case. Um, you know, even when there's an immense amount of study that happens through digital modeling or, you know, consultants or whatever the case might be, it's never going to replace. Um, what happens in the end, right? So it's always usually a nice surprise because we're typically being conservative about things uh, and over planning for it. And so, yeah, it's really nice. Yeah. That's the thing about light, actually. Yeah, that isn't is, it? it is. <laughs> so, do we have uh, more questions? Yes, I think so. Hi, I'm uh, Lisa from uh, Belgium, and um, I was wondering, you are talking a lot about light and a lot of indirect light, but what about view? Because um, the question, of course, is not only the light itself, but also it comes with, with the view and how you are um, yeah, framing the view. For sure. Um, a good sort of example there, one of the projects I showed was Sluice Point. And, you know, we're lucky where we're working, especially in those rural scenarios. Like the landscape is, I think, you know, some of the most beautiful landscapes in the world. Um, and so we're obviously, uh, it's, it's, that's, that's where the money is spent, right? That's the main thing for the client. You know, how do you capture this? But then also, how do you keep that hot summer sun out? Uh, and so, you know, oftentimes it's something as simple as, you know, the uh, projection of the overhang, which might actually taper, or a band of brisole on one part of it where it's going to be excessive. But then on the flip side is my house, where it's about having as much light in as possible, but there's no view. Like, there's, there's nothing on the other side of the road or anything out there that you're looking at. It's just, it's an urban kind of condition. Um, and so I would say that was the most sort of perfect example of how light is reflecting and refracting in like every direction uh, while also protecting privacy and view that doesn't matter. Yeah. So 
maybe the last question. Is there any question that wasn't here which you were hoping for? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have something on your mind that we should just finish off with that wasn't said already? Or have we? I don't think so. I'm yeah. just I'm so happy that... Uh... Oh, there is one. Omar, thank you for your talks. As always, inspirational. <clears throat> As you can see, you do a lot of new builds, but we also have a lot of existing buildings. Can you share with us with the wisdom of what we can do with existing building mass, how we can bring all the thing, the beauty that you do with the new builds into the existing building mass, and still actually follow up on, on all these other things that is, uh, you need to know uh, something about with sustainability and everything like that. Have you any reflection on that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, and I think the one of the early ones I showed uh, that one restaurant where we carved out the inside and, you know, we have a variety of additions and renovations that we're working on that really sort of carve out the core of the building, right? So you have this central light that emanates uh, down through a stair core. Uh, you know, I think that's been the trick for us is to sort of centralize it as much as possible, especially in these urban sort of projects where there's a great depth to the lot and the building itself where it actually gets dark the further you go back. So it's just this wonderful treat, um, I think, that happens uh, on the inside that you wouldn't normally get and almost replaces um, the sort of courtyard plan that you would see in um, landscapes and, and geographies more closer to the equator. Thank you. This has been very inspirational. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>